when we arrived at the Tate residence. There were lights on the outside. I went towards the house. And I said, make it stop. And she said, no, I can't. It's too late. The screams that I heard were blood-curdling, chilling screams. Five people, including the actress Sharon Tate, have been found brutally murdered at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, film director Roman Polyensky. One of the most horror-filled, nightmarish uh, nights of murder in the recorded annals of American crime. He could get them to murder whomever he asked them to murder. <laughs> their religion, their cradle was to kill as many people as they could. In July of 1969, I had just turned 20. My relationship with my husband was not there. I wasn't a priority to him. No, Bob. And there was this girl, Gypsy, and she was a part of Charlie Manson's family. Gypsy said, don't worry, you know, you can come live with us. I told Linda that we were a group of people that took care of each other and loved each other, and we were all one. Let's just get out of here, OK? I immediately decided to go with her. There was no second thought. When I left, I was searching for love, and freedom. I was searching for God. Linda was very quick and very open to coming to the ranch and being with people that would love her and take care of her and Tanya. Spawn Ranch was very peaceful. Everyone was loving to each other. Everyone was trying to get away from the cities and society. She did mention that Charlie Manson, he was a man that everybody looked up to. She told me he was beautiful, and he would take care of you and your daughter. It would just be lovely. <laughs> The ranch it was an old movie set for cowboy movies with the saloon and the livery stables. It was dry, it was dusty, it was hot. Welcome to the spawn. This is it, honey. It's beautiful. Hey, it's beautiful. Gypsy took me around and introduced me to people. Linda, this is Katie and Sadie. Hi. 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 So you can hug them. They were happy to see me, which really made me feel good, made me feel wanted. <laughs> Was there a party last night or something? <laughs> Every night. <laughs> All right, we'll catch up with you later. I'm going to let Linda know where she can crash. Bye. 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 Squeaky, George, this is Linda. Hi. 
I became more and more excited. It just felt right. Hey, Clem. Hey. Leslie, come out, meet Linda. How are you doing? Hey. Huh? Yeah, I'm just cooking. <laughs> oh, it smells good. What is it? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Mixture of things. So how long are you in LA? I don't know. I'm just going to see which way the wind blows. Oh. Charlie. I hadn't met Charlie yet, but there was a lot of excitement, and I became very excited at the thought of meeting him. Charles Manson was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, November of 1934, and he took to a life of crime very early. I think the first crime that we know about, he burglarized a grocery store uh, at the age of um, 12, I think, and committed armed robbery at the age of 13. He was committing petty crimes, forging government checks, taking a woman across the state border for prostitution purposes. There was a homosexual rape thing behind bars. He put a razor blade to the throat of a co-inmate while he was sodomizing him. And when he got out of prison, he was 32 years of age. 17 out of those 32 years were spent in reformatories and prisons. Where's she going? She's gonna go make friends, play a little bit. Are there a lot of kids here? Yeah. I was comfortable leaving my daughter because they had other children there. Is she okay? <laughs> I left her in their care. I was comfortable with communal living. I was basically comfortable with the unknowns. I started seeing that people cared about each other and shared. It was like nobody was better than the next person. Tex was gruff and greasy, but he just always had this beautiful smile and these beautiful eyes. I was attracted to him. And he kind of had me the first night. He made me feel like I had never felt before. <laughs> you good. More than good. <laughs> no, you haven't met him yet, but Linda, when you do, when you hear this cat talk, man, it is... <sighs> He's just the greatest man, you know? What y'all think about your husband? We were supposed to sail to South America together, but... It didn't work out. And you had the money to take a trip like that? Yes, yeah, friend inherited. Was that right? How much? I don't know. They keep like hundreds there in the trailer. Well, that money ain't theirs, girl. My husband's friend inherited a sum of money which was kept in the trailer. It was $5,000. I was willing to take the money. Hello? Hello? I didn't do it to hurt my husband, but for acceptance within the family, 
stealing $5,000 from somebody was a major thing. It wasn't like taking, you know, $5 or stealing cigarettes out of your mom's purse. looked upon as, wow, she did this for us. And that's why I did it, was to, to give something to them. <laughs> After I had brought the money back to the ranch, I finally got to meet him. Hey, Charlie. Meeting Charlie for the first time was very exciting. Hmm. I remember he got down and felt my legs. So, brings you to Los Angeles. Still in there? Are you in there? I asked what brought you to LA. My husband abandoned me, and Gypsy said that I'd be welcome here. Hmm. That makes me happy. There was a magnetism about him, charisma charm, power. Where's Linda? Where is she? My husband and the person whose money it belonged to came to the ranch. Challen. No, y'all want to talk to him. I remember really being scared and seeing him and just hiding and hoping that you know, he wouldn't come find me. Listen, man. I'm Linda's husband. We want our money back. Linda don't belong to you. Nothing belongs to you. That money don't belong to you. What are you talking about? That's our money, man. Well, if you feel so strongly, why don't you kill me? Hmm? Take this knife, put it into my chest. Do you see that if I give you the right to kill me, then that gives me the right to kill you? He gave me the feeling that I would be cared for and that he took care of everybody. I eventually felt really safe and protected. We were like his children. We were his children. Manson gets out of prison in 67. It was at the height of the summer of love. And he ends up in San Francisco the Haight-Ashbury district, which was kind of a mecca for hippies around the country. So he goes up there with his guitar, and everyone was gathering around him. The kids were just uh, literally at his feet. So he started this group that he called his family. 
Patricia Krenwinkel from Los Angeles. Her father was an insurance executive. At one time, she wanted to become a nun. Leslie Van Houten, she was a homecoming princess at Monrovia High School. Susan Atkins, she was born in Los Angeles. She grew up in San Jose. She gravitated to San Francisco and became a kept woman, a topless dancer. Tex Watson came from Farmersville, Texas. He had almost an A average in high school, he was a football, basketball, and track star. Bobby Bosley was one of the men, played music. Spawn Ranch was maybe 25 miles from downtown LA, but in terms of lifestyle, it was a couple light years away. It was a timeless existence in an isolated setting. and had all the sex he wanted, the food, the music. He became a little guru up there, a celebrity of sorts. People loved his music. And he had a certain amount of ability. He composed songs, including the lyrics. He was really a brilliant musician. Charlie was almost Dylan-esque. He wasn't just rambling. He was really singing and making you think. A typical day would be Charlie playing guitar, telling stories, dancing around, just being free. Everybody was like one. You know, there was a harmony amongst all of us. And it was actually beautiful. There was a situation that was planned. That we were gonna have an orgy, drop acid and make love. Just kinda got heated up. Manson would go on quite a few LSD trips with his family, sometimes two, three, four a week. Very cleverly, however, either he'd take no LSD himself or a smaller dosage of LSD than they would so he could retain more control over his mental faculties. There was nothing bad or wicked or evil or wrong about it. It just all felt good, all felt right. Just dancing crazy, wildly, with no inhibitions. You know, everybody's just kind of flowing, and it's just beautiful. <laughs> and Manson, at that point, became a maestro, orchestrating what everyone else did. No one else touched anyone else or kissed anyone else or made love to anyone else unless Manson told them to do so. A new girl joined the family. He would induce her to have sex with another girl, boy with a boy. There was an interaction that really touched me between Leslie and myself. For me, having sex on LSD was actually a very spiritual feeling. While they were on these trips, he would dig down very deeply into their psyche and try to remove many of their long-standing convictions on life. The subversion of sexuality was one way he broke down the ego. He realized that they would do whatever he wanted them to do if they had no ego. Manson got them to creep into people's homes at night, rearrange the furniture, and people would get up and they'd see all the furniture rearranged. It was a scary thing. But he had this phenomenal ability to gain control over other people and get them to do terrible things. Eventually, he convinced them that he was the second coming of Christ and the devil all wrapped up in the same person. Lose the ego. Free yourself. 
from the restrictions of self. Move with the rhythm of nature. Commune with the trees and the waters. Don't ask why. Be. But remember, the wall of Armageddon is coming. Everything is gonna be destroyed. Amen. But not the chosen ones. No. And when the whole world comes crashing down, when Armageddon is over, it is we who will survive. When we rise from the ashes of Armageddon, well, we gon' need our future generation with us. Shut up, Leslie! Shut up! We are the chosen. Amen. Charlie said there was going to be a racial war and that white man was going down and black man would be on top. At the time in the 60s, it wasn't so far-fetched to believe that maybe there was going to be a race war. The times were very unsettled and violent. The Black Panthers were coming up and saying black power. And Watts blew up in flames. They were anticipating at that point a war between blacks and whites, but they were not going to be a part of it. During the war, he convinced his followers. He said, I'm going to take you to the bottomless pit in the desert, a place he derived from Revelation 9 in the Bible, which is all about Armageddon. He said, the bottomless pit is a land of milk and honey, 12 types of fruit on every tree. Manson thought the black man was going to win this war. He said it was their karma, their turn to take over. They'd been stepped on by the white man for centuries. But Manson was a racist, and he believed that blacks were subhuman, that they were less evolved than the white man. So it was their turn to win the war, but he said, Blackie will never be able to handle the reins of power because Blackie only knows what Whitey's told him to do. So he said the black man would have to turn over the reins of power to those white people who had survived, whereupon he said, we'll come out of the bottomless pit and we'll take over the leadership of the world. He convinced them that this Armageddon was going to bring about a new and a better social order. And he used the Bible and the Beatles as uh, foundations and support for what he said. Clem, Clem, Matt, you gotta hear this. <laughs> the Beatles are talking to Charlie. And I got that message loud and clear, man. I have that message loud and clear. It's Helter Skelter, man! It's Helter Skelter! Yeah! When the Beatles' White Album came out, Charlie listened to it over and over and over and over again. He was quite certain that the Beatles had tapped in to his spirit, the truth, that everything was going to come down, that the black man was going to rise. It wasn't that Charlie listened to the White Album and started following what he thought the Beatles were saying. It was the other way around. He thought that the Beatles were talking about what he had been expounding for years. Every single song on the White Album, he felt that they were singing about us. The song Helter Skelter, he was uh, interpreting that to mean the blacks were gonna go up and the whites were gonna go down. Helter Skelter represented the last final destructive war on the face of this earth between, uh, between men. And he called that war Helter Skelter. The Beatles were his heroes, but he felt if he were given the chance, he could outdo the Beatles. What Manson really wanted to achieve, he wanted to become a recording star. His first contact with anyone of any substance would be Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys.
Dennis had picked up Patricia Krenwinkel and another member of the family hitchhiking on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, and he brought them back to his home on Sunset Boulevard. Manson and the family were living there for a while. <laughs> it's like a like a test of enlightenment to see how far you're into the drugs, well. Right? People who got to see what you got, Charlie. You'll have recording producers lining up into the desert. You got that right, man. Dennis Wilson, I believe, was fascinated with Charlie's mind and the kind of music he wrote. He was bored with the uh, Beach Boy sound, and he wanted to do something more. And Dennis himself tried to record the family, Charlie and the family, several times at his recording studio at his brother's house. He saw great potential in Charlie. Hey, hey you heard of Melcher? Produces of birds, Terry Melcher. He would love this. He would love the look, the vibe. <laughs> I dig the birds, man. I will set it up. You two are going to love each other. Want to dance? Dennis thought that Charlie could be a rock star. He introduced Charlie to people in Hollywood. And he was always talking him up, telling whoever that they should listen to him. Dennis took Charlie to parties. At one of the parties was Terry Melcher, and he introduced him to Terry Melcher, who was Doris Day's son. There's a time for living. The time keeps on flying. Think you're loving, baby, and all you're doing is crying. Can you feel? Terry Melcher came out to listen to the family one time in 69. I remember that Charlie was very nervous. I think Charlie thought that he was going to be famous. Charlie wanted a record contract from Terry Melcher, and he thought Terry Melcher was the person that might make him a star. I believe, Mr. Melcher, that this is your stop. <laughs> it was good to meet you, Charlie. You and the you and the whole family. So, we got a deal, or I'll get back to you. You guys, you have a have yourselves a great night, okay? Mm -hmm. The very first time he went to Seattle Drive, Melcher was living there. And then Melcher moved out, either in late 68 or early 1969. And who moved in? Sharon Tate and her husband, Roman Polanski. Terry Melcher said, I'm very interested, and I will give you a call real soon. So of course, Charlie took your word as your bond in prison. If you say something, you've got to mean it. And Charlie waited for that call, and he never got that call. Hey, Wilson, my man. You a hard fella to locate. Where you been at? Huh. Well, we're, we're here, we're good, we're ready. Uh-huh. Yeah. I still ain't heard nothing about that deal, though. Uh-huh. So where's, where's Melcher at? Oh, he is. So, uh, so where's that leave us, man? I mean, where we at? You won't, you won't say that again, Dennis? Well, we had a deal. What's changed, Dennis? What? Oh, he. Did. And what what kind of what kind of man is Melcher? Is he some kind of baby? Huh? 
What kind of man is that? Do you understand who you are speaking with? What are you telling me, Dennis? Huh? Do you understand who you are dealing with? What are you telling me, Dennis? What are you telling me, Dennis? me. We're going to deal with these liars face to face. He got very upset when he didn't get the record contract. So he went looking for Dennis Wilson. Message, Charlie? Yeah. You give him that. Manson went back to Seattle Drive looking for Terry Melcher. Even though Melcher had rejected him, he wanted to prevail upon him to audition him again to give him another chance. Slim, where's Melcher at? This is the Polanski residence. <laughs> no, 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 my friend Tara Melcher lives right no, here. No, no, this is the Polanski residence. I don't know who you're looking for, but they're not here. What are you talking about, man? I don't understand okay, what you're saying. Okay, look, you gotta go. You gotta take that back alley and get out of here. Go! Go! Manson went to the Tate residence, thinking that Terry Melcher was still living there. But Sharon Tate and her husband, Roman Polanski, were. Her photographer friend, Shea Rakatami, kind of booted Manson off the premises. And it's my belief that this residence, 10050 Cielo Drive, which is where Sharon Tate lived, came to symbolize the establishment to Charles Manson, particularly the establishment's rejection of him. And there was a moment in time when Manson undoubtedly had to look into the eyes of Sharon Tate. Sharon Tate was 26 years old, a young starlet on the threshold of fame. Very, very beautiful by everyone's estimation. She didn't have any big movie behind her, but she had been in several movies, married to Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski was a famous director Polanski. They made the movie Rosemary's Baby. People I spoke to, without exception, spoke extremely highly of her. Not only was she beautiful outwardly, but inwardly. She's a beautiful human being. Sharon and Roman had an absolutely wonderful relationship. She worshipped the ground he walked on. I was staying with Sharon, and she came in from a trip into town she came back with this little grin on her face and did the shoulders like this. And she says, sis, we're pregnant. And I said, what are you talking about? We're pregnant. Roman and I are going to have a baby. And I just started crying. And she started crying. And we did the little 
little dance, and it was a wonderful moment. There was talk about Helter Skelter, if not on a daily basis, on a regular basis. There was um, an excitement surrounding it. Um, it's like, you know, I don't know, I guess it's like when you know there's an event that's gonna happen. Everything was coming to a point, coming to a head. Charlie told us that there was going to be a great war. Charlie said, you know what we're going to need? We're going to need an army. And his big vision was that the motorcycle gang called the Straight Satans would be an army for us. He used the girls to attract them. Do you think they are beautiful? They've been taught to lose their fear. They are trained beasts. They don't do whatever I tell them to. You like her? Hmm? Want her? You can have her, my friend. You know what kind of a war this is going to be? L.A.'s gonna burn. Every last bit of it gonna burn right on down to the ground. They ain't gonna know what hit them. Not nah, on one of them. Piggies. Bop, bop, bang! The world is gonna pay for 2,000 years of sin with a smack in the mouth. It wasn't peace and love and hippies anymore. It was almost like an army. Everyone knew that you had to do exactly what Charlie told you, exactly when he told you. It was a matter of life and death, and it was also a matter of your life and your death. Is everything OK, Charlie? You look a little upset. Get up, Gypsy! Okay, I'm get sorry. up! I'm sorry. I'm Shut sorry. up! I'm sorry. Shut up! Did I'm I ask sorry. you a goddamn I'm sorry. thing? I'm sorry. Shut up! I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what your problem is? <laughs> you think too much and you ask too damn many questions! <laughs> Charlie was kicking me, and I rolled over in a ball trying to protect my body. <laughs> I didn't know why he beat me. He instilled terror towards the end there in every single person around him to have total control over them. The main reason why we all stayed was a deep-seated belief that what Charlie was saying was true, that the cities were going to burn, people were going to shoot each other, and the only way to survive was to band together with this group of people. The music was not happening anymore. Everyone knew that we needed money to survive. So now Charlie was trying to get money any way he could. 
He went back into his criminal thinking. Gary Hinman was a music teacher that lived in Topanga Canyon. Charlie had an idea that Gary Hinman kept money at his house. Shut up, Gary! Shut up. Gary Hinman furnished drugs to the family. He was not a member of the Manson family. He was an associate. Manson sent Bobby Beausoleil and Susan Atkins over to Hinman's residence to get money. Hinman said, I don't have any money to give you. So Beausoleil called uh, Charlie back at the ranch and said, Gary's not giving us any money. He says he doesn't have any money. So Manson goes over to Hinman's residence. And he has his sword with him. You owe us. Why don't you pay what you owe? We've helped you, huh? Haven't we? We help you, hmm? We paid you for our drugs. Why don't you help us? Do what you gotta do to free yourself from this pain. Do what you gotta do, Gary. Do what you gotta do, Gary. Do it, Gary! Hinman was refusing to turn over any money. Manson proceeds to slice off a part of Gary Hinman's ear. Manson tells Bo Slaywell, you know what to do with it. Make it look like the black has done it. So he was predicting to his family that the black man was going to rise up against the white man. The black man was not doing what Manson had predicted. So now Charlie said, we're going to have to show Blackie how to do it. After killing Gary Hinman, Bobby Bosley dips his hand in Hinman's blood and leaves on the wall the paw print. That was a symbol of the Black Panthers, indicating that the Panthers had killed Gary Hinman. They also printed the words political piggy in blood. To Manson, piggies were the white establishment. Manson wanted to start Helter Skelter by murdering white people and framing the black man for it. He wanted to ignite a war between blacks and whites. Busted, Bobby. After the murder of Gary Hinman, Manson realized he could get these young kids to murder whomever he asked them to murder. Not only was he out to start Helter Skelter, but he was viciously striking out at the establishment that rejected him.
Oh, I really hope we go to Venice for milkshakes. Really? That'd be awesome. Mm, strawberry milkshake. Really? Yeah. Chocolate. Chocolate. Ooh. And a burger. Onion rings, oh, fries. Oh. I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to go on a what was called a creepy crawly mission. Basically, it's a home invasion break-in. It was wrong, stealing, of course, you know, and I knew that then. But it was the excitement and the fun and the thrill. Katie and Sadie were in the back seat, just being bubbly and happy and excited that they were picked also. That was it. We took off. Before we left the ranch, I remember that we um, uh, all took some speed. A white capsule was handed to me, and I took it. I felt special, excited, chosen. Tex? What? Turn on the radio. How about some manners for once there, Sadie? Oh, please, Tex. OK. OK. Doing okay, honey? Yeah. yeah. Where are we going? Wait, wait and see. The last time that I had called Sharon that evening was probably in between 11.30 and midnight, just prior to midnight, somewhere in that zone. She had her friends, Wojtek and Abigail, and Jay Sebring visiting her. Jay Sebring was the first innovator in men's hairstyling. He was a very dear friend of Sharon's, but had actually been started off as a, a romantic interest. Uh, and it was a very close friendship after the romantic interest had, had ceased. Abigail Folger, heiress to Folger Coffee, and her boyfriend, Wojtek Frakowski, were visiting her that evening as well. Roman had been away in Europe the whole summer. He was due to come back in a day or two, and she just couldn't wait. She really wanted to do the, the mommy and daddy at home in their, in their sweet little nest with waiting for their little chick to arrive. You know, she really, really was looking forward to that. <laughs> Movie. Three words. <laughs> First word. Eating. <laughs> soup. Eating soup. <laughs> Shh. 
when we arrived at the Tate residence. There were lights on the outside. The driveway was lit up. All right, watch for me. Tex has got rope around his arm, and he's got wire cutters. And I remember thinking, why does he have that? He cut the telephone wires. There was a car coming, so we got down. Tex jumped out. Tex shot the gun four times. Bang, 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 bang. take the wallet from the kid that he shot. I got in the car. There was this person slumped over. I didn't see any blood or anything, but I knew he wasn't there. Go around back. You two come with me. Tex told me to go to the back of the house and him and the girls went to the front of the house. I went towards the house. There was a swimming pool there. I felt like an empty shell. It's like my body was there, but I wasn't. Everything is locked.
screams that I heard coming from the house were blood-curdling, chilling screams, screaming for your life. And I couldn't tell if they were male or female. They were just screams. Sadie comes running out. Give me a knife. Make it stop. Make it stop. It's too late. Just listen for sounds, OK? And I saw a man, and he had blood all over his face, and he looked right into my eyes, and he was dying, but in his eyes, what I saw <laughs> was that I felt he was dying because of me. <laughs> Tex was stabbing him, and he just kept stabbing him down to the ground. And I saw a woman in a white dress, and she had blood all over her, and she was screaming. And she was calling for her mom. And I saw Katie stabbing her. I thought about going to a house. There was lights down the road. And I was going to do that. And then I said, no, don't do that, because they'll find me, and they'll go there, and they'll kill all those people. So I went down the hill, and I got into the car, and I just stayed there, and I waited. I just stayed there and waited. Get over. They were all covered in blood. Tex was like really, really angry that I was there. Oh, man. You gonna do anything right tonight? I'm gonna take you out back and beat you when I get home. Keep it goddamn straight, Linda! Whoa! Did you hear that piggy squeal? Oh! Oh, man! The blow is everywhere, man! Whoa! Take that. Take that. Yeah, no. What do we do with the knives? Give him the Linda! Give him the Linda! And the clothes! Give him the clothes! Give him the clothes! Give him the clothes. Whoa! He handed me knives. He handed me a gun. He told me to wipe the prints off. Get rid of them! Roll down the window and get rid of them! Come on! Woo! I think I hurt my arm. It was real hard. God, get the knife through the bone. Oh. Oh, I think I strained it. Katie was complaining about her hand hurting, that while she was stabbing Abigail, the bones were in the way, and it was hard for her, so it hurt her hand.
got back to the ranch. Charlie was there. All good? Got any remorse? And I remember thinking in my head, what does remorse mean? What the word, what's the word remorse? Guys, potato chips are the real thing. Their honest to goodness real potato chip flavor is great on any occasion. So when your chips are down, don't forget the guys, real potato chips. This is KBC Morning News. In a scene described by one homicide detective as looking like a weird religious rite, five people, including the actress Sharon Tate, have been found brutally murdered at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. Miss Tate was eight months pregnant. She was discovered in a tight nightgown with a rope tied around her neck that was connected to the body of a man. Miss Tate and the four other victims had died from multiple stab wounds. It was never said prior to seeing the news that there was a pregnant woman in there, or at least I wasn't aware of that. Devastating, <laughs> very devastating for me. My thoughts went to um, going to get help. I didn't do it because I was afraid that they would kill me and they would kill my daughter. At 8.30 this morning, Winifred Chapman, an employee, came to work at 10050 Cielo and found several bodies in the house, and immediately the police were notified. On the night of the Tate murders, Stephen Parent, an 18-year-old a young man who was visiting the caretaker of the residence. Tex Watson shot him four times, left him dead behind the steering wheel. The killers rounded up everyone inside. Sharon Tate, Jay Seaburn, Abigail Folger, and Wojtek Rakowski in the living room. They had a rope and they threw it around the necks of Sharon Tate, Abigail Folger, and Jay Sebring, and they secured the rope by throwing it over a beam in the ceiling. And then they pulled on it to make it very tight. Watson said, you're all going to die. And that's when they started begging and pleading for their lives, but there was no mercy. And the vicious stabbing and the horror and the brutality began. It was an orgy of murder. Wojtek Furkowski was stabbed 51 times shot twice, hit over the head with the butt of a revolver 13 times. Abigail Folger was stabbed 28 times. Jay Sebreen was stabbed seven times, and he was also shot. Sharon Tate was stabbed 16 times. and she had rope burns around her neck. Susan Atkins told me that she told Sharon Tate, look, bitch, I don't have any mercy on you. You're going to die. There was a moment where she was thinking of trying to cut the baby out of the womb. Uh, I mean, so horrible that you don't even see things like this in horror movies. 
Before they left the residence, Susan Atkins dipped a towel in Sharon Tate's blood and wrote the word pig, P-I-G, on the front door of the Tate residence. Roman was an absolute basket case on the other end of the telephone. Uh, his pain was extremely clear. It was uh, one of the strongest people that I had ever met, totally breaking down. This is a man that survived the Nazi invasion of Poland the things that he had seen, the atrocities of life, the greatest that one can imagine. And he went to a pool of rubble on the other end of the phone. Manson, on the night of the Tate murders, was trying to ignite Helter Skelter. It didn't make any difference who the victims were. But as long as he was going to start Helter Skelter, he may as well choose a home that, in his mind, represented the establishment to him, particularly the establishment's rejection of him. The residence symbolized the show business establishment that he was trying to penetrate, and they rejected him. Overnight, the sale of guard dogs and guns rose dramatically. So you could almost measure the fear that was going on in the entire community. Particularly uh, in Beverly Hills and Bel Air, the heart of the movie colony. Not only because of the incredible brutality of these murders, but they appeared to be so random and devoid of any conventional motive. Manson already had plans to murder prominent movie star personalities like Frank Sinatra, Liz Taylor, Richard Burton, Steve McQueen, Tom Jones. Their religion, their cradle was to kill as many people as they could, and they were not about to stop here. The second night, they were looking throughout the city of LA, this vast metropolis, for their victims completely at random. Lino and Rosemary LaBianca lived at this residence. I think it was 3301 Waverly Drive in the Los Feliz area. Of Los Angeles. Lino was the owner of Gateway Markets, a small supermarket chain in LA. His wife had a very successful boutique. Well, on the second night when I was told I was going, I knew full well that this was going to be a mission of murder. Charlie went with the rest of us because he said that the murders the night before were too messy and that he was going to show us how to do this. He was going to show us how to kill.
last name. Go on now. Go with Tex. I couldn't feel any relief. There was still that sense of dread. I mean, I knew some people were gonna be killed. Manson was able to tie Lino and Rosemary's hands behind their backs. And he sends Tex Watson, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten into the house with instructions to kill them. Manson drove off. Rosemary LaBianca had 13 post-mortem wounds. She had already died, and Leslie Van Houten continued to stab. Now that shows, you know, gusto, relish, enjoying what you're doing. Leslie Van Houten later said, the more I stabbed, the more fun it was. So poor Rosemary had 41 stab wounds. Lino had 26 stab wounds, but in addition to that, they left a knife and a fork protruding from his body, and Patricia Krenwinkel carved the word war on his stomach. The police, when they arrived, found, if I recall, a pillowcase over the heads of Rosemary and Lino, and there was a cord from a large lamp next to each of them, wrapped around their neck very, very tightly. And they wrote the words helter skelter on the refrigerator door in blood. They wrote the words death to pigs and rise, R I S E, on the wall of the living room. After the killings, what did the killers do? Well, they took a shower and then they had something to eat out of the refrigerator. And then they proceeded to hitchhike back to Spawn Ranch. He asked me about a person that I had met on the beach days before. He was an actor. He said, well, then we're going to go there, and I want you to kill him. Charlie took off, and myself, Sadie, and Clem were left there to do this job that he told us to do, which was to kill this actor. And Charlie said he wanted me to knock on the door. And when the man came to the door, to just slit his throat. Sorry, I must have knocked on the wrong door. The only thing to do 
was to thwart the plan and knock on the wrong door. It's not him. <sighs> Let's just go back if we can't find him. To not do what Charlie told me to do was the right thing. I just wasn't going to kill somebody. If Charlie wanted to kill me, then he was going to kill me. But I wasn't going to do this. I felt like I was facing death. What convinced me that I had to leave was the fact that innocent people were being murdered by this family that were supposed to be loving and caring and kind and were basically little robots doing this killing that I didn't want to be a part of anymore. Linda? I'm gonna need you to do a little something for me. I'm gonna go see Bobby tomorrow. You do that? In jail? See if he's okay. See if, um, see if he knows what he's gonna say. Yeah, that's my good girl. This was the opportunity that I was figuring that I could escape. I went and packed a bag for my daughter. I had to hurry up and almost hold my breath so nobody would sense or, or feel my fear, my anxiety my urgency to just hurry up and get out of there. I had to portray that I was, you know, just on this mission to go see Bobby. But my intent was to leave. Where are the kids? They moved them over by the caves. What do you want with them? Nothing, I was just wondering. I tried to take my daughter with me. She was at the waterfall, so I was not able to get access to her. But it was 
the time to leave, knowing that I could not take my daughter with me. Charlie? I'm going to see Bobby. All right. Bye, Charlie. I was terrified. I was afraid that he was going to be able to read me. And I drove. on that stand for a total of about a week. Uh, let's face it, she is the proverbial star witness for the prosecution. If there was to be any kind of sense made to this nonsense, then the truth did need to come out.
They were average American kids. And that's what was so shocking. You would never dream that these people would be mass murderers. So it shocked the entire country. Only Manson had a motive for these murders. And that motive was helter skelter, to ignite a war between blacks and whites. So it was a combination of motive and domination over his family that allowed me to convict Manson of the seven Tate LaBianca murders. What do you plan to do with your life now? I'd like to go into the wilderness with my children, get down to nature, and be closer to myself and to closer to God. It's a tragedy to Linda Kasabian that she got involved with the wrong group of people, and this has haunted her for the rest of her entire life. But believe me, she was not cut out of the same cloth as the Manson family co-defendant. She was, she was different. She was more like a flower child, a real hippie. She's not a murderer. I could never accept the fact that I was not punished for my involvement in this tragedy. I feel then what I feel now, always and forever, that it was a waste. It was a waste of life that had no reason, no rhyme. It was wrong, and it hurt a lot of people. Still, now, today, and always, forever. <laughs> 